it's not going to be a six week fix, especially not the way we're doing it in this country. I think if we like literally had everybody stay at home and everybody did it, we could probably get out of this in six to 12 weeks. But that's not what people are doing. And so I think we're in for a long haul. Welcome to the Zami Nobla National Organization of Black Lesbians on Aging podcast. We are your sound source for Black lesbian history. I'm your host, Angela Denise Davis. On March the 22nd, 2020, we held a webinar with Dr. Tonya Potit, who so graciously facilitated a Q&A on the topic of the coronavirus-19. If you missed that webinar, then you can catch it here as we have uploaded it for our recent podcast episode. It was an incredible offering, and we are so, so grateful for Tonya Potit, PhD, who is a researcher and professor in the Department of Social Medicine at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. In addition, she's a former guest of the Zami Nobla podcast. I'll put a link to her previous episode in the show notes. It's very important during times like these to get information from people who know. The information we received from Dr. Poteet was very meaningful. And as she noted, this information was current as of March 22nd. With this pandemic, things are changing every day. What's important, though, is for you to get as much information as you can to protect yourself and your loved ones. We enter the Q&A with Dr. Poteet as she is talking about current research and the importance of getting information from trusted sources, like Dr. Tonio Poteet. When you do have access to information, keep in mind the source of that information. If they say scientists say or doctors say, find out what doctor, what scientist, where they work, you should be able to Google the name of the person and find out their credentials. And if you can't do that, I wouldn't necessarily trust the source. And so what I'm going to tell you today has always been traced back to the original source that I believe is trustworthy. You'll also see people referring to articles that have been published um, about the virus. And I can tell you the peer review publication process takes at minimum about six to eight weeks. So what you're seeing often are people publishing their studies before they're peer reviewed, just to make sure that they're out there in the public sphere, but they are not conclusive final studies. So just know that as well. And some of the things I'm gonna be sharing with you are from those, what they call preprints, that have not gone through that rigorous peer review process yet, but that have been put into the public domain so people have access to what people are working on. So into the virus. Um, People are often confused about why they call it the novel coronavirus. Um, The coronavirus is a family of viruses. Um, You can think of it like the herpes virus has type 1 and type 2, and there's different versions of different families of virus. So this family of virus is called coronavirus. It's called novel because it's new. It's never been seen in humans before, and um, that means that nobody on Earth um, before this virus appeared had any immunity to it. And that's part of why we're seeing such a big pandemic right now. The technical name for the virus itself is SARS-CoV-2. SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. So you might remember 15, 20 years back, there was a SARS epidemic, and that was SARS-CoV-1. So what we're seeing now is SARS-CoV-2, a different virus. The WHO, the World Health Organization, developed a name for the disease, and that name for the disease is COVID-19. And it's coronavirus identified in 2019 is what that stands for. So COVID-19 is the disease. SARS-CoV-2 is the virus. And it's called novel because it's new and never been seen in people before. So now I want to go to your questions. Um, And I'm just going to read through all the questions that Marianne sent to me and give you the answers um, as best we know them today, keeping in mind that, like I said, information is coming out fast and things might be different tomorrow. But as of today, this is the best information I could find to answer your questions. So the first question was, how long can the virus live on surfaces? There was a study that was done that was published in the preprint um, that took the virus and sprayed it into the air and 
took the virus and sprayed it on different services and then checked um, periodically to see how much of the virus was left. That's how they did the study. And what they found is when they sprayed the virus into the air, it stayed in the air for about three hours. Now keep in mind, when someone is coughing, they're not spraying from a spray bottle, tiny droplets into, into the air, they're coughing. And so those droplets when you cough are much heavier and fall to a surface much faster. So it's very unlikely that the current virus from a human being sneezing is gonna stay in the air for three hours. But it's theoretically possible for a fine mist to stay in the air for three hours. When it comes to a surface, how long the virus can live on the surface depends on what surface it is. And keep in mind, unlike um, some most bacteria, viruses really require a human in order to make copies of itself and propagate itself. So the longer it sits on a surface without living in a human or whatever its host is, the more of the viruses die. So when they say, for example, the longest the virus has been found to live is on plastic for 72 hours. So the number of viruses at, the, at minute one is going to be so many more than the number of viruses at hour 72. So just keep that in mind, the amount of virus goes down exponentially over time, but virus can be identified on most surfaces, uh, on plastic surfaces up to 72 hours, on things like cardboard up to 24 hours, and it just depends on the surface that you're talking about. The second question is, what is the best way to sanitize? Um, the very best way to sanitize is literally soap and water. Um, a friend of mine posted something on Facebook the other day that showed the structure of the virus. And if you think about it, it's um, sort of like little protein sticks held together by fat, basically. Um, so if you think of like a ring of fat and you stick some uh, Q-tips in it, um, that's what's holding it together. And when you put soap and water on it, it dissolves that. So soap and water really is your best bet. If you don't have access to soap and water, then hand sanitizer with 60 to 70% rubbing alcohol is your next best bet. And then the CDC has guidelines around Clorox solutions and things like that. But most household cleaners, soap and water, anything that you use to clean things around your house should be sufficient to kill the virus and to sanitize. The next question is how effective are N95 face masks? So there's all these words floating around, like what is an N95 face mask anyway, right? So an N95 face mask the N95 stands for the fact that it filters out 95% of particles. So there's N100 masks, which are very rare, that filter out 100% of particles. What most people use in these kinds of situations that are healthcare providers are called N95 masks. An important thing to know about these masks is that they come in different sizes. And for healthcare providers that are going to be in, in, uh, engaging in activities that expose them to risk, they get measured and fit tested for these masks. So if you're wearing a mask that you just bought at the store, there's no guarantee that that's actually the right fit for your face. I got fit tested for mine recently, and they basically put the mask on your face, you, you put it on as tight as you can around your face, and then they have you hooked up to a machine to see what can get through. And they have you in very different positions, bending over, talking, to make sure that the mask still has a secure fit around your face. So even if you have access to an N95 mask and you're using it, I, I actually don't recommend, there's no guarantee that it's actually working for you if you haven't had it fit tested. So do keep that in mind. I think we're going to get to some of the other questions about what you should be using. But the greatest benefit for the general public who's not going to be working in a healthcare setting, taking care of very sick people, um, is anything that covers your mouth and nose. So any kind of mask, a bandana, anything that keeps you from touching your face. Because the biggest risk for most people going around their daily lives is not that somebody with, with COVID is going to sneeze into your face, but that somebody who might have had COVID will have um, sneezed or coughed or, and touched their face and touched something else or sneezed and coughed onto some surface. So your goal is gonna to be to try to protect yourself from touching something and then touching your face. That's why washing your hands is really important and um, how a mask can actually help you to keep you from touching your own face. What do we know about how this virus um, originated and in the country, for example, an animal in China? That's a really great question. We know that the virus existed in animals and then jumped to humans, right? So it mutated and was able to infect humans. Now it's important to keep in mind that all viruses mutate all the time. And by mutate, I mean genetic changes. If you think about um, someone having kids, for example, your kids don't come out looking exactly like you. Every child is a little bit different. Viruses make many, many more copies obviously than humans do, and each copy is a little bit different. And some of those copies are different enough that they're able to infect humans. And that's what we saw in this um, shift of the virus from being able to infect animals to being able to infect humans. 
the best guess right now, um, you might have heard the thing about the bats and, and um, pangolins, which I had to Google. I'd never heard of a pangolin before. But humans and bats don't actually interact that much. And they thought it might have been bats because when they looked at the genes, the, the RNA, which is like DNA, but, but different, in the virus, it was closest to what the kind of coronavirus they see in bats. Um, but then there has been more recent research that found that the virus is actually 99% similar to the kind of virus that they see in pangolins. And so Google pangolin, it's some creature I'd never seen before, which humans have interacted with. So either way, it was from being in a setting where there were lots of live animals who brought their live animal diseases, and then those viruses mutated, and there were lots of humans around, and those humans got infected. And then because we have such a traveling global kind of world, as soon as someone gets infected and goes to another place, this virus is so infectious that it didn't take long to spread around the entire world. Um, the first cases were identified um, in Wuhan province in China at a, a seafood market, an open air seafood market. They call it a wet market. That's important because a wet market is not like a market where you might go to the grocery store and they have canned and dried goods. It's a market where there's also live animals, fresh fish. It's literally like wet, <laughs> which is a very easy environment for viruses to propagate. Uh, the next question is, what is the possibility of the virus being developed in a controlled environment and transported across several countries? That is a question a lot of people have, like, could this be a human-made virus? And uh, interesting enough, um, there are scientists who've studied this, and they published a paper in a journal called Nature, which is one of the most highly respected scientific journals out there. And what they did is they looked at the genetic makeup of the virus, and they found that there wasn't really evidence that it was man-made. In order to keep from boring you to death with a lot of <laughs> scientific detail. Basically, if humans were gonna take a, a virus into a lab, um, what they would do is take a very virulent virus and then make it infect humans. And what they found is that this was a coronavirus that was already in animals that mutated to be able to infect humans. So there wasn't any evidence that humans had constructed um, a virus to be more virulent to um, cause mayhem and destruction. The evidence to date shows that it was just a virus that was in animals and it hopped over to humans and not that it was human made. Um, the next question is how is it transmitted to humans? And I think I've already answered that. Um, we know that the most common way it's transmitted, this came up so I wanna make sure I make the, the difference. People who are sick with COVID-19 and who cough have a lot of virus particles that come out. So they are the most infectious to other people. However, when people are sick, they're not gonna be around a whole bunch of other people, right? They're usually quarantined if possible, but they know they're sick and other people aren't usually around them. So even though they're very infectious, they're not as responsible for the rapid spreading that we see as people who are not symptomatic. So people who may have been exposed, they're in that incubation period before they have symptoms, can transmit the virus to other people, even though they're not shedding as many virus particles, because they might be going around their regular life and interacting with the whole rest of the world long before they develop symptoms. And by then, they've exposed a lot more people. So that's what we see in terms of the virus propagating. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. I think somebody had a more specific question about that. The next is, is it safe to attend a private event with more than 50 people in attendance? And there's another question about these numbers that I'll get to at the end, too. And the truth is that that number is made up, right? So the federal government says no more than 10 people. I think there's some states that say no more than 50. Some places say no more than 100. It's very confusing because it's completely inconsistent. And it's completely inconsistent because the goal is basically for you not to interact with any other person at all. But they know that humans are not going to do that. Um, especially American humans tend to be very resistant to that. So they're trying to figure out what's the lowest number that they can um, recommend that people might actually do to reduce the number of people that get this virus. Why is the number of people important? People have probably at this point all heard the term flatten the curve. What does that mean? That means that this virus grows in an exponential fashion. So I'm gonna see if I can draw a little bit. So a linear fashion would be like this person gets sick and this person gets sick and it goes up in like a line like this. The way this virus works, because each, per each person who gets sick um, or who has the infection is so infectious, it's so easy to transmit that one person 
might infect another person. And then that person infects like three more people and that those three people then infect three more people and those three people infect three more people. So you get a curve that looks like this in terms of the number of infections, they go up really fast. And we see that in the United States. A week ago, we had 3000 infections. And as of yesterday, we had 21,000 infections. So that's what's called exponential growth in infections. So the way to stop that, what we're trying to do with the recommendations for social distancing is that you don't interact with those other people. So if you have the virus and you get better, you have not been exposed to other people in the time where you were sick or not sick. So hopefully that answers that question. To limit to as few people as possible that you interact with. Um, and those numbers are just sort of pulled out of thin air. The next question is once a vaccine is found, would it be offered to everyone like the flu vaccine? That is a great question. Um, there are things that we still don't know about this virus. Nobody even knew this virus existed. It wasn't in humans before December 2019. So it's only been around for three or four months. Um, we don't know if it's seasonal. We haven't had a, a change of seasons in this country to be able to tell that. I doubt it personally because we see this virus in countries where it's very hot right now and they don't have any reduction in cases because or lack of cases because it's hot there. So I, I would be surprised if it's seasonal, but we don't have data on that yet. Um, and we don't know if this virus will change from year to year. The reason people get flu vaccines every year is because the flu, the flu virus changes a little bit every year. We get different types of viruses each season. And so scientists come together in the room, they try to predict how the virus is gonna change, they develop a vaccine to combat that virus, and then we give it to people every year. So the jury is out on the answer to that question. Um, the next question is, why do more people seem to be dying from the virus in Italy? That is also a great question. There are lots of theories about this. Again, there isn't any data to know for sure at this point. There are some factors that might explain at least part of why we see such a high death rate in Italy. One is that the Italian population is much older. Um, they actually eat better and take better care of themselves than we do in this country. So their population um, is actually much older. And we know that older people who get this virus are much more likely to get sick and much more likely to die than younger people. So that could be a factor. Also in Italy, it's very common for people to live in multi-generational families. Um, so the older people are living with the younger people who are, and, and grandkids and so on. And with all those people together, it's very easy for the virus to be transmitted um, to the older population as well. And I think importantly, what I wish we were learning, I hope we're learning from what happened in Italy is that they really didn't respond fast enough. They didn't take this seriously and they didn't do anything um, for several weeks after the virus entered Italy and end up in a situ situation now where the entire, most of the country is in quarantine in an effort to try to stem the tide. So I think acting earlier is gonna be really, really important for preventing what we see in Italy and other places. The next question is most of our products come from China. How likely can the virus remain active in cardboard boxes or other containers after arriving in the USA? Um, so as I mentioned before, the virus requires a human host for ultimate survival. Um, so when it's on a surface, it's kind of hanging out waiting to find the next human and it can only last so long in that way. Um, as I mentioned, the, there have been studies looking at different surfaces and the longest was 72 hours on plastic. On cardboard, it was about 24 hours. So if you think about how long it takes to get from China to the United States, it's very unlikely that a virus is going to survive that long and be um, on the outside of a cardboard box. So I think that is, that's pretty unlikely. The next question is, does COVID-19 leave scar tissue? And if so, what can be done about it? Yeah, so the, the way that this virus causes disease and death um, is pretty horrific. So I'm gonna walk you through it. If you think about how the, the lungs are made, the way we breathe is in our lungs are basically little air sacs. Um, all of us have little air sacs and the air goes in and out and helps us to breathe. And that sends oxygen to the other parts of our body that need it to survive. What this body does is induce this incredibly intense immune response that then fills up those sacs in our lungs with water. And obviously you don't want the sacs in your lungs filled with water because that makes it nearly impossible to breathe. And that's what we see people struggling for air and needing to have um, ventilation um, because their air sacs are filled with fluid. 
as the body continues to try to fight, um, it develop, it does develop scar tissue. They call it pulmonary fibrosis. That scar tissue makes those sacs then stiff. So even if the fluid goes away um, and somebody starts to get better, it is possible that that scar tissue is stiffening or pulmonary fibrosis remains. And that can cause chronic long-term problems with breathing, even if the person survives the COVID-19 disease itself. There isn't a cure for pulmonary fibrosis. Um, People who have pulmonary fibrosis for a variety of reasons um, often are managed by giving them supplemental oxygen. So people have portable oxygen sometimes. Pulmonary rehabilitation is sometimes what people do. So helping people get stronger so that um, their breathing is more efficient. Um, And then ultimately, depending on the severity of their pulmonary fibrosis, a lung transplant is an ultimate way to, to address that. The next question, can COVID-19 be transmitted to and from animals? I think we have already talked about sort of the bat and pangolin where we think it came from. Right now, we don't have any evidence that uh, COVID-19 can be transmitted uh, to or from household pets like cats and dogs and things like that. Um, We haven't seen any evidence of of that. That said, people do recommend that if you come in the house, obviously you should wash your hands immediately, but also if you pet your animals that you wash your hands after you do that as well because they have fur, where if you had the virus on your hands, you petted your animal, it would be possible to transmit that way. Is a temperature, I think this is higher than normal, also a cause for concern in connection to the coronavirus? Um, This is a great question. So what we know about how, um, how people present with symptoms is evolving. Some people actually don't present with fever first. The most common symptom often is fatigue and then uh, shortness of breath or trouble breathing and fever. So those are the three most common, um, fever, shortness of breath, trouble breathing, and cough, coughing or sneezing. So those are the top three. But there's no guarantee that fever is going to be the first thing. And I I have seen people monitoring their temperature to see early signs um, of COVID-19. And unfortunately, that's not entirely effective because if your first symptom is a cough and you get a fever several days later, um, that's not really going to give you the information that you're looking for. But most people do eventually develop a fever. If some people are asymptomatic and still carriers, why shouldn't everyone be tested? Everyone should be tested. I'm just going to be flat out with you. In a world where we had a government that was prepared and access to enough test kits, everyone should be tested. And in fact, that's what they did in South Korea to um, rein in their epidemic. And they were very successful by just mass testing everyone. Unfortunately, we are in a situation in this country where we do not have enough test kits to do that. So that's why there are guidelines that are shifting regularly around how often people should be tested based on how many test kits we have in the country and um, how available testing is. It is definitely not ideal. Um, Are LGBTQ people more susceptible to COVID-19, for example, because of tobacco addiction, health inequities, and things like that? So there was a statement that came out from the LGBT Cancer Network stating that because LGBT people tend to have higher rates of smoking and higher rates of HIV and immune suppression that we as a community are at greater risk for COVID-19. I actually feel like um, while those things are true, people who smoke and um, people who have immune compromise and lung disease are more likely to have severe um, outcomes from COVID-19 if they get infected. They're not more likely to acquire the disease. They're just more likely to have a bad outcome when they acquire the disease. I think our issue as a community is more related to stigma and discrimination and distrust of healthcare systems. And so maybe unwillingness to to seek healthcare when we need it um, because of that discrimination and more likely to live in poverty and have concerns about the economic cost of not just getting the test, but being hospitalized, being intubated. Um, Nobody's even talking about how much that kind that level of care costs and what that might mean for people who are already living at the margins financially. Should we be concerned if we have, if we've had the flu without a test for the coronavirus, especially if there may be lasting effects of having had COVID-19? It is possible to have both the flu and the coronavirus, but there isn't a treatment for coronavirus. There's no approved treatment. Um, There's no approved vaccine yet. So testing positive wouldn't provide any access to treatment that wouldn't be provided to somebody who had severe respiratory symptoms, regardless of the cause. Um, what it would what it would do if facilities are available is let the person know that they should be quarantined to protect other people and isolated if they need to be in a, if they're in a hospital setting. 
and that others around them should wear protective equipment. Um, that is the extra information that would be provided by having a COVID-19 test. And then somebody wanted to know the sensitivity and specificity of the COVID-19 RNA test. So there are many, many, many tests. So um, there are, I think, about seven commercial tests that have been developed by companies like, I think, Hologen is one of them. But there's several sort of commercial companies that have developed tests. There's also university-based um, centers that have developed their own test. So our, I work at UNC and our um, laboratory developed our own test. Um, and then there's state level tests. So there are many different tests and none of them have gone through the usual process for FDA approval because that takes too long. They are approved under what's called the Emergency Use Act. And so under this Emergency Use Act, they are not required to disclose their sensitivity and specificity data outside of what they presented to FDA to get that approval. So we don't actually have access to the sensitivity and sensitive, sensitivity and specificity data um, on these tests. Um, unfortunately. They're not in the public domain yet. How likely is it to carry the virus asymptomatically? So I'm going to give two answers to that. Um, we know that people can um, have the virus and not have any symptoms because the incubation period is on average um, five days and sort of the outside estimation is about two weeks. And that's why people are recommended to self-quarantine or isolate for two weeks. Is it possible to have the virus, have no symptoms, and then get better? That might be true. I think the way, to, the way that we would know that is if we had mass testing available. And that way we would know if somebody had it. Because if right now, if you have no symptoms and you get better and you develop antibodies, we have no way of finding that out. First of all, because the current tests only test for RNA, so actual live virus, not for antibodies. And we're not doing mass testing. Um, the next is, how should a small healthcare environment with bare-bone staff respond when staff present with a mild cough? <sighs> that is a really tricky one. There are guidelines, um, and I can send this to um, Marianne to distribute to everybody. The American Medical Association, the Centers for Disease Control, and the Bureau of Primary Healthcare all have guidelines and resources available. Um, the American Medical Association has recommendations that we are following at our health center that we advise anybody who has any respiratory symptoms to call in advance and have screening over the phone before they come in. So that way you can sort of direct people who have symptoms that suggest they might have COVID-19 to a testing center if that's available to you or to advise them to um, self-treat and stay at home and self-isolate to avoid overwhelming the staff. Um, if the person does show up, it is recommended that they be taken to a separate room and isolated from everyone else and given a mask. Um, while they're evaluated and that the person who's evaluating them uses personal protective equipment while evaluating that person. I know it's a challenge. Um, I'm on lift serves with other healthcare providers who are really either running very low on personal protective equipment or don't have access to any at all. And that is a huge challenge. And I think that's more of a reason to phone screen people and, um, and have a, a separate place where people are evaluated if that's available to you. Um, one person told a, a story ab about having gotten really sick um, and having gotten better and wondering if they had COVID-19. So I won't share that person's entire personal story. But my response is it's possible if you've had a significant respiratory infection recently um, that it was COVID-19, especially if you weren't tested to find out for sure. And if you um, this happened like sort of December and the person had traveled outside the U.S. to Italy or China or one of the early um, places where there are a lot of cases, it is possible, definitely possible. Uh, the next question is that once, once somebody's had COVID-19, are they then protected and immune from getting it again? Most likely they are. Most people when they have a viral infection and they develop antibodies, that antibody is protective. What we don't know is how long does that antibody last and is it possible for people um, to get it again? We have seen some cases where people were better and then got sick again but it's not clear whether those people were reinfected or whether they were relapsed, like they didn't get entirely better and then got sick again. Most of the researchers that I've read their work um, believe that this is a relapse and not a reinfection. And I just wanna talk a little bit about the difference between the viral test and the antibody. So the viral test looks for the actual virus in someone's system. So if somebody doesn't have an active infection, you're not gonna be able to find the active virus but it won't tell you if they've had it in the past. 
when we are exposed to viruses or to vaccines, we develop antibodies. So our own bodies make these proteins that basically recognize that virus. So if it comes in again, it goes, oh, I know who you are. I'm going to fight you off right away. And there was a, a, a team who have developed an antibody test that they're submitting to FDA for approval. Um, the benefit of the antibody test, it would be able to answer some of those questions about um, how long people might have immunity after they've been exposed. And if somebody had an asymptomatic infection and got better and developed antibodies, you'd be able to tell that as well. The next question is, does everyone who's infected and testing positive get sick? Are there a lot of people infected who never feel ill? So again, we don't know because we're not doing mass testing. Will a test indicate if a person has been exposed um, like the chickenpox virus? So that's what I was talking about, the difference between the antibodies and the virus test. So right now, the test that we have available look for the virus itself only, um, not for antibodies, which is what we build up to help protect us in the future. Um, once we have an antibody test, I think we'll have a lot more information about that. And I'm hopeful. I think the company that's making it is suggesting that that test might, come, might be even available in the next couple of weeks. We don't know for sure until it's out there, but that's the plan. The public has been advised to stay six feet away from each other, self-quarantine for two weeks if they're symptomatic, and not be in crowds of 10 to 50. Are these numbers based on scientific algorithms or pure guesswork? That is an excellent question. So I'm going to go through them one by one. The six feet apart piece. This is based on previous data that suggests that droplets from a person who sneezes or coughs with COVID-19 won't go further than about six feet away. So the idea is that you are far enough away from the people around you that if somebody does cough and sneeze, that you're not gonna be coated with COVID-19 viruses. Of course, it's possible for people to have really intense sneezes and coughs that go much further than that, but that's generally considered the average and um, recommended then as a safe distance to stay away from other people in case they cough or sneeze near you. The two weeks, it's totally confusing, the terminology about self-quarantine and self-isolation and what does that mean and how long do you do one of either? So I wrote, back, wrote out notes so I could make sure I said it to you accurately. Self-quarantine is when somebody who is at risk for COVID-19 but does not have symptoms. So say you were at a concert and you found out somebody at that concert had COVID-19. You don't have any symptoms yet or at all. Then you would self-quarantine for two weeks. And the reason for that is that within those two weeks, we expect somebody who's got COVID-19 to develop symptoms. And that way, during that time when you don't have symptoms, you're not exposing other people. Um, during the time of self-quarantine, it's expected that people would avoid other people, use the standard hygiene, wash their hands, not share towels or utensils with other people, not have visitors, stay at home themselves, and stay six feet away from other people even in their own household. Until those two weeks have passed, then we know if the person has symptoms or not. Isolation is for people who have COVID-19. And this can take place either at home or in a hospital setting. And I know now people are being encouraged if they do not require hospital support, like oxygen or supplemental breathing or ventilation, that they um, I self-isolate at home whenever possible. Um, how long should that last? Um, the Best information that I found was from the Centers for Disease Control, and they recommend that the person stay self-isolated if they have COVID-19 until they have had no symptoms for at least 72 hours, so three days, and at least seven days have passed since their last symptom. However, if you have COVID-19, hopefully you're engaging with a healthcare provider, and that person is providing you advice on when it's safe for you to, to stop self-isolating. Uh, self and obviously, if you're in the hospital, the hospital team will make that decision about when it's safe to no longer be isolated. And then the final question about the crowds of 10 to 50, I think I answered earlier, um, that number is made up. The fewer people you interact with in a day, the less likely it is that the virus will be transmitted in an exponential fashion through the population. So the larger the crowd, the greater the risk of passing it on to many, many, many other people who then go on to pass it on to many other people. The fewer the people, um, the less chance of that. So, um, that took about 45 minutes or so, and I am happy to answer other questions through the chat function. Um, let's see, given what we know about COVID in Italy with so many dying, do you think that that would have been the place where a vaccine will develop? Um, that's actually a great question. People who um, are looking at developing tests and then developing vaccine are actually trying to um, access the blood, blood of people who have had COVID-19 and recovered so that they can look at those antibodies and use that to help develop a vaccine. That said, 
I think this is week two or three, I can't remember now, I've been trying so hard to keep track, but two or three of vaccine trials that have already begun in Seattle, which is where we had our first big um, outbreak in the United States. So they are testing vaccines already in the United States. Vaccine trials usually take a while. And the reason they take a while is because you have to make sure that they're safe. You don't want to widespread give it to people and find out, oops, it not only wasn't that helpful, but it was harmful. Um, and then they have to make sure they actually work. And that takes time. And that's why you might have heard the estimates of about 12 to 18 months for vaccine development. Around that same time, they also started trials um, of a medication called remdesivir to see if that works as a treatment against COVID-19. You've probably heard about a whole bunch of other different medicines that have been tried and that have been uh, called cures, but it's important to know that none of these, the virus only appeared in December. People have just started doing research trials just now. So we certainly don't have enough information to know if these medications that people are proposing for treatment are safe or if they work. That is actually, unfortunately, going to take time to know that for sure. Wow, people have lots of questions now. Okay. Ah, I've heard that some people experience GI symptoms and develop COVID-19. Yes. Um, so two things. There are some people who have GI symptoms first. Um, from what they've been able to tell so far, nobody has had only GI symptoms and develop COVID-19. The caveat is if you don't have respiratory symptoms in this country, you're not going to get tested. <laughs> so um, usually GI symptoms are uncommon and are usually associated with other respiratory symptoms for the people who've been tested for COVID-19. They have found when they've done uh, swabs for COVID-19 around exam rooms of patients who had COVID-19 that they have found it in the toilet bowl, suggesting that there are viral particles um, eliminated in the stool, but they don't know if those viral particles are still infectious or not. So I think we don't know yet whether it's transmitted through fecal matter. That said, you should not be contacting people's fecal matter for all varieties of reasons. <laughs> um, so. I think that's uh, the jury's out on whether it can be transmitted that way, but avoid it anyway. Since the virus can live on plastic, how do we protect ourselves after handling plastic grocery bags? That's, that's a great question. So the recommendation um, that I've seen that seems the most feasible to do is if you're at the grocery store um, and you've handled your plastic bags, when you, take, when you get your groceries home, that you take them out of the bag immediately. Um, sanitize any surface that they're on, sanitize your hands. And if it's something that is like a, a can or something like that, it's come in contact with the plastic bag, that you sanitize that as well before you put your groceries away and also your fresh produce and things like that. But I think most people, at least in my family, always clean the vegetables and the fruit when they bring it home anyway from the grocery store, but it should be easy to do that with just soap and water. Because as I mentioned, the virus is pretty easy to, to destroy with just soap and water. But yes, that is the recommendation. I think a person who has diabetes is, is concerned about self-quarantine. Um, right now, I think the goal is for all of us to spend as little time as possible with other people. If you think that you have symptoms of, of COVID-19 or worried about having symptoms of COVID-19, then I think you're, you should be concerned about protecting other people around you and making sure that you get the care that you need. And if other people around you have been exposed or potentially exposed to COVID-19, then protecting yourself. Any information about age 60 and over needing special precautions? Yeah, so the data that we have um, coming out of China suggested that, not just suggested, but actually people who are 60 and over were much more likely um, to have a bad outcome from having COVID-19. So the curve, just like the curve went sort of like this for infection rates, we saw that in terms of age. So around 20 to 48, you see like a, a rate of death that's less than 1%. And then as we got older and older and older, and up into the 80s, we saw rates as high as 20%. So not more likely to get COVID-19, but if you get COVID-19, you're more likely to get very, very sick from that. That said, as more data is coming out of Italy, they actually do have a significant proportion of the younger people, um, 20 to 48 years old, who are actually getting quite sick. From the virus. So it's not a protection to be young. Ah, are there any ways to volunteer for trials in Georgia? That's actually a great question. I'm not, I know that there are trials happening in Seattle. I think you'd have to check with your local health department about whether they are not, whether or not they're doing trials for treatment or vaccines in Georgia. And thank you. That's a very generous offer to, to want to be on the front lines volunteering for vaccine trials and things like that. When they are testing volunteers for vaccines, what are they doing? Um, I don't have the protocols of what they're doing for vaccine trials, but I'm almost certain based, 
based on my experience with other vaccine trials, is you want to make sure absolutely first that the person does not have the infection. So I'm sure they are screening those people for COVID-19. And then they are giving them a vaccine, which I assume is an antibody-based vaccine. So they take some portion of the COVID-19 virus itself that is not infectious, and then they usually inject that into a person and that person develops antibodies. So I suspect that's what they're doing because that's what they do to develop other vaccines. Well, how long do I think the government recommended self-quarantine is going to last? Are we talking weeks or months? Um, I can tell you what I think is effective and I have no idea what they're going to do. I think we're going to need to do this for the long haul in order to see significant reduction in future cases. So the flatten the curve means that we're not necessarily trying to stop having the virus propagate altogether. The fact is that we think that most people eventually are going to be exposed. What we're trying to do is have the number of people exposed um, and who get sick happen over a longer period of time for a couple of reasons. One is to reduce the strain on the healthcare system. So the more people who are sick at once, the less access we have to healthcare providers, the less access we have to protective equipment, the less access we have to ventilators should people need them. Um, and the less likely that people who have any other chronic condition who might need surgery because they break a leg or have a heart attack, those people won't have access to healthcare either because it's being overwhelmed by the number of people who are coming in with COVID-19 related illnesses. So if you slow that down, it doesn't overwhelm the health system. Also, if we slow it down for long enough, that gives time to get results of these clinical trials where they're looking at vaccines and they're looking at treatments. And so maybe by the time um, the restrictions are lifted, we will be able to mass vaccinate or mass treat people. That is the goal, but it, it's not gonna be a six week fix, especially not the way we're doing it in this country. I think if we like literally had everybody stay at home and everybody did it, we could probably get out of this in six to 12 weeks, but that's not what people are doing. And so I think we're in for a long haul. Um, is there any reason why we shouldn't be able to do, just go out to drive around if we're willing to stay in our cars? <laughs> teenager and she's getting stir crazy. Absolutely. I go out every day. I'm super self-isolating, but I go out every single day for a walk because nobody's six feet around me and I'm fine. Getting in your car is fine. If it's your car and you're not putting a whole bunch of people in the car going in and out of your car, then yeah, leave the house. <laughs> Just don't expose yourself to other people. I, you know, I can't even imagine people have kids stuck in the house with them all day long every day. So the weather's getting warmer. I think it's a good excuse to let people out of the house as long as they stay six feet apart. Ah, does the virus survive on meat products, fresh versus frozen meat? So that's a great question. So I think we are used to thinking about things like salmonella and other kind of bacteria that can grow in meat products, but the virus doesn't grow in like dead things like meat products. It sees it just like any other surface, so like a countertop or like a plastic. The virus is still hanging out for a living host. Um, so I would say the maximum would probably be 72 hours because that's the maximum we've seen it on any other surface. But there's no evidence that it can grow on meat or things like that. I recommend cleaning, obviously, your meat when you get it home in case somebody's touched it, but it shouldn't be able to grow there. Does the virus live longer in warmer or cooler temperatures for household temperatures? That's a great question, too, and we don't, we don't know. There isn't any evidence that it grows um, slower or faster in colder or warmer temperatures. It seems to just want a human body. Um, but then again, time will tell. Should I be fearful of going to the grocery store even though there's no possibility of getting protection? That is a great question. I think you don't wanna starve, right? So you have to go to the grocery store um, and get food. And I think there are people who are really advocating for the people who work at the grocery store who are actually exposed to tons and tons of people who come in and out of the grocery store in the grocery store line and who can't be six feet away because they're scanning your food to be able to have at least gloves. Um, if you go to the grocery store and you don't have any personal protective equipment, and I'm a healthcare provider, I don't wear personal protective equipment to the grocery store. I touch as few things as possible. I don't like sift through the boxes and the cans to find things. I like pick up what I want, put it in my cart. Um, most of the uh, grocery stores now have a place where you can sanitize your hands when you go in and sanitize when you go out so that you, um, when you, and then if you have hand sanitizer or soap and water, that you can do that before you drive home and then wash your hands as soon as you get in the house. So I, I think it's not worth starving, um, but to be very careful when you do go out, whether it's to the grocery store or anywhere else that's necessary for you to go to. Regarding the handling of meat, does cooking the meat um, kill the virus? 
actually there we do know from most pathogens that heating them high enough for long enough will kill them i have not seen any studies that have looked at that for the coronavirus in terms of meat i suspect that that is true just like washing it disrupts that little layer of fat that holds it together i imagine cooking it will be similar how high the temperature needs to be and for how long we don't know yet for this virus <laughs> what is the most ridiculous thing you've heard? That is a great, the most ridiculous thing I've heard is that if you can hold your breath for 10 seconds, then you don't have coronavirus. That that's a test. So if that worked, we would have diagnosed and everybody in this country. So plenty of people can hold their breath for 10 seconds and have coronavirus. Plenty of people who can't hold their breath for 10 seconds don't have coronavirus. So that is not a test. I think the second most ridiculous thing I've heard is that if you drink water, it washes the virus down to your stomach where your stomach acids will kill it. And that's actually not at all how this virus works. This virus loves your respiratory cells. So your nose, your mouth. And so once it's attached there, it doesn't matter how much water you drink. It has found its home. It is there. It is not going to be washed down to your stomach and killed by stomach acids. So I think that well, they sound ridiculous to me because I have a lot of medical training. I think there's a lot of people who don't have medical training and medical information that unfortunately are being convinced that those things are true. So I think it's very, very important for those of us who have better information that we share it with people who don't so that they don't mistakenly feel safe when they're not and then don't do the things that actually will help them like washing their hands and staying at home. So we have about five more minutes. Um, I just want to take that time to say thank you all for showing up and for caring enough. And um, I think. Uh, I am recording this, so I don't know that Marianne is recording it. I'm happy to share that with people with the caveat that this is March 22nd at four o'clock. So tomorrow we might have new information. Um, as much as I can, I will post accurate information as I get it on the Zami Nobla page and to share it with Marianne so she can also share it on all of the pages that I might not have access to. And wash your hands, <laughs> stay safe. Um, and take good care of yourselves. I really appreciate you all showing up for this. Thank you, Dr. Poteet, for an incredible Q&A. You've given us information to think about and a challenge for us to participate in making the world better as opposed to creating a burden for the healthcare system, for our family, for our friends. These are uncertain and unusual times. And if we're honest, it's a little scary. We don't know what's happening next. But what we do know is that there are things we can do right now social distancing, washing our hands, checking in on folks, healthy, eating, being creative. Wherever you are in this world, in the midst of this pandemic, I hope you have what you need. May you find something sweet to satisfy your soul. And as always, friends, thank you for listening. Hey. 